Welcome to the third episode of Explaining Rust Analyzer, a series where we try to understand Rust Analyzer, one subsystem at a time. Last time we looked at a virtual file system. Uh, one other thing uh, I was talking about is how VFS works by creating uh, a series of consistent snapshots, which evolve over time. VFS moves from one snapshot to another snapshot where you apply the div to go from one to another. Today, we will be looking at another thing which follows the general uh, similar pattern. So let's open the code and let's look at the IDE crate. So the IDE crate is the main facade for the language server. Uh, this is the crate which packs up the internal APIs of Rust Analyzer which work with uh, semantic Rust concepts, such as uh, functions, definitions, references, cross-references, and packs them up into an API, which is useful to, which is convenient to use from an IDE. The difference here is that in IDE, you don't really care about a specific language. And for example, when you do something like rendering a completion widget, you don't really care that, for example, this clamp uh, actually uh, corresponds to some function in some language. You only need to know about the label and the text edit um, this completion contains. So uh, that is the essence of this ID API. It lowers the internal rich semantic data structures into plain old data structures, which can be easily serialized to JSON and which then can be displayed by the editor to the user. The ID API is based of the two types, the analysis host and the analysis. Let's start with the analysis host. Analysis host is the primary store of data. It is exactly as VFS in a sense that it is evolving via a series of snapshots. So you create analysis host using the new method and then you apply changes to it using the apply change method. Let's actually write uh, a little bit of example code here. So let's say we have some analysis host and then let's say that we have some change and let's say that now file with uh, id0 contains new text content and now let's apply this change to the host Yep. So uh, initially we had an empty state of the world. Then we moved to a state of the world where there is one file and the contents of this file is uh, an empty main function. And after that, we can move to another state of the world, say, do some kind of like change to no matter what it actually is and then apply change to and so on uh, and so forth. Note that after we apply the change, we can actually start asking the IDE about uh, certain functionality. For example, we can ask for, yeah, to ask for any specific functionality, any specific uh, ID query, we first need to create an analysis. And then we uh, can say something like analysis highlight this file and the file will be highlighted. Uh, let's uh, dive deeper into how this all works. First, uh, let's uh, take a closer look at the analysis. 
uh, as you notice, it actually doesn't have a lot of state directly in it. It has only a single field, which is a database. We will be covering salsa database later in the series, but for now, just assume that all the actual state actually is stored inside this thing. The change is also a rather simple struct. So the main thing it contains uh, is the changes to the uh, file texts uh, in the format, which is similar to what we've seen in the virtual file system. We use the same file ID. Uh, in fact, you can see that this is a VFS file ID. And for each file ID, we specify the current state of the file, which is none if the file doesn't exist or a string uh, if the file has some contents. Now that we use arc string here to share the underlying data with the VFS. So while VFS manages the actual storage, the analysis host still needs to know uh, about the files and their file contents. Another thing we have here is this vectors of source root, and it relates to the concept of file set, which we've discussed last time when discussing VFS. Uh, to uh, remind you, VFS has this ability to take the whole set of files and partition it into the set of disjoint file sets. And the reason for that is that we want to associate each crate with a specific file set such that when we edit a file, we only need to invalidate the crates which belong to a specific file set. Uh, that way we can optimize processing and for example, do not reprocess code from crates.io crates or standard library crates when we edit some code local. Source root is exactly that plus an additional bit of information, uh, whether the specific source root is treated as a library. Is library here doesn't have a very strict semantic definition. Uh, mostly uh, it specifies uh, if this is mostly read only. And we use this flag to optimize uh, the way Salsa works internally. Basically, Salsa assumed that things which belong to libraries are changed rarely. That means that when they do change, Salsa needs uh, need to spend more time processing those changes. But uh, as a flip side, when things outside of libraries do change, Salsa uh, doesn't have to invalidate things inside libraries at all. So uh, this is just an optimization. This isn't uh, anything semantically significant. Uh, okay, so uh, we've covered these two things, the set of files and how the files are separated into file sets and source roots. The final component here is crate graph. We will be covering the crate graph and eternal project model in a separate lecture. It's a pretty complicated topic, but in a nutshell, what crate graph stores, it stores uh, what crates uh, comprise the current projects. For each crate, it stores what the main file of this crate is. And finally, it stores the dependencies between the crates. Together, all three gives you both the physical uh, input what are the source files, as well as a logical input, how these source files are organized into source roots and crate graphs. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, using this change, we can construct arbitrary complex uh, multi-crate, multi-workspace projects in memory. We uh, won't be covering how applied change works exactly in this lecture. That's a material for a future lecture about Salsa. But basically, uh, today it's enough to understand that uh, this applied change just assimilates changes into the host. And now the host uh, reflects a state of a world where all the changes are applied. Now, uh, yeah, uh, one thing we do want to note here is that apply change changes the data. So naturally, it requires exclusive access to the analysis host. Finally, the analysis creates a reification of a snapshot. Analysis it is read-only, and if you have an instance of analysis, you can be sure that the underlying data will not change underneath your feed, and that every call to analysis will always return the same result. The interesting thing to note is that naively, 
you would actually expect analysis to be just a reference, a shared reference to analysis host, or maybe some kind of uh, this thing, like something which stores the reference to the actual data uh, which is stored. This is not really true. So uh, as you see, analysis doesn't have any lifetimes on it. It's an own type. And the picture uh, we uh, see internally is something like this. There is a private shared state, which is uh, behind an arc. The analysis costs, which exists on a single uh, value, uh, it cannot be cloned, holds a reference to the state. And there are also arbitrary many analysis uh, instances which also store a reference to this same shared state. Why do we need this setup? Why can't we just use one type and reference to it? Well, uh, actually, I think it would be possible to have just a single type and references, but well, maybe it wouldn't. No, I think actually, yeah, I think actually it wouldn't be possible to uh, use references here. This is a little bit subtle. We will cover it a tiny bit later. Uh, but now let's give you like not the real reason, the accidental reason why we want this. And the reason why we want this is that we want to be able to process changes concurrently. Basically, if you imagine the way IDE works, first the user types something like uh, it creates a new function, and then the editor sends a change to the IDE. The ID takes this change in the LSP format, converts it to change, and applies this to the analysis host. And now it knows that the state of the world has changed. That means that it needs to recompute a lot of things which are visible in the editor. For example, we want to recompute the set of diagnostics. We want to recompute the syntax highlight. We want to recompute the inlay hints, these uh, types which are shown here in the like pseudo comment uh, uh, way. It would be possible to recompute all those things sequentially, but because the underlying data is the same, it actually makes sense to ask the underlying infrastructure to compute those in parallel. And this is actually uh, what is possible in Rust. So uh, in Rust Alliance. You can do something like this. This, you can spawn a thread, and in this thread you can create analysis. Well, you can create analysis in the main thread and then you can move this owned type to another thread. And for example, in parallel with this, we can also do, I don't know, inlay hints. Yeah, like this. So uh, that's the first motivation why we need this split between analysis cost and analysis. There is more to it though. Let's continue imagining this uh, IDE working further. So again, uh, user typed something. We received a change. We applied the change to analysis. And we spawned to background jobs to process this change in the backgrounds. What happens if now user continues to type something else? Obviously. Uh, we now have another set of changes and we want to apply them to analysis host. And the question is, how do we do it when those two courses we've spun before might actually still be running somewhere in background? We can try to apply the change in place, but that means that the data, which for example, syntax highlighting is now using, uh, becomes inconsistent the contents of a file at the start of the syntax highlighting might be different from the contents of this file of the very same file at the end of syntax highlighting. We obviously don't want to have that uh, inside our ID model because we want to have this repeatable read property. 
we generally uh, want to get some data, compute some index out of it, and then come back to that index later and assume that it is valid. If, for example, we computed some positions in the file at the start of the syntax highlighting, in the end of syntax highlighting, we want to be sure that these positions refer to the same syntax node uh, they had referred to at the start of the process. So, mutation data in place uh, isn't really uh, nice. And it also would uh, make the programming, like the actual programming, pretty uh, inconvenient because you would have to use interior mutability there. And that means that you would have to wrap every bit of state into mutex, which isn't uh, really nice to program. The second approach here is to create fully immutable data structures. Basically, rather than apply change mutating the host, it could instead create just return new a new host. So the API would look like this. When you apply the second change, you keep the existing host, the existing state as it is, and just create a new bit of state and then spawn uh, some processing using this uh, next version of host. This is a great model. And this is how, for example, Roslin works. Uh, there are two theoretical problems with it. I'm not ready to claim that these theoretical problems are actually also problems in practice because I haven't tried to write uh, two different models and compare them uh, to each other. But still, this immutable data structures model has a certain uh, drawback. The first is that, well, everything needs to be immutable and depend only. Every data structure needs to be persistent data structure. And persistent data structures takes more CPU time to process. And what's more important, they take more memory to store. They are generally pointer-based containers. In Rust, we really want to optimize for memory usage uh, and for performance. And we really want to just use flat arrays to store as much of the things as possible. The second drawback of uh, this immutable approach to storing state is that while by creating a separate copy of the state, we let this background work to continue uh, running using the old state, this actually is pretty useless. Uh, if we know that there is a new change and we actually changed the state of the world, then the highlighting we compute using the old state isn't actually necessary. It's obsolete. Uh, in fact, we've spawned a new version of syntax highlighting, and we really want to use this result instead. And for this, uh, this now just burns CPU time uselessly. This isn't really, really that useful. So instead, in Rust Analyzer, we do uh, a, rather, uh, a rather interesting third approach. Rather than rotating data in place uh, and, uh, well, I guess, yeah, I, I guess I haven't covered all of the alternative approaches. First approach is mutate data in state and lose consistency guarantees during analysis. This is bad. The second approach is to just use immutable data, uh, which is good, but well, forces to use immutable data everywhere. The final approach is that when we want to apply change here, we just wait until this works completes and only apply change once we know that host is uh, at runtime, the single reference to the underlying data. This is similar to uh, arc make mute or something like this. The problem with just waiting here, though, is that we won't be able to apply this change until the syntax highlighting actually is done. And as syntax highlighting takes some significant amount of time, like hundreds of milliseconds, uh, at least now, that's really not optimal. Specifically, if the user types something really, really fast, then uh, the actual changes will be starved because each change uh, will be waiting until the syntax highlighting is fully completed. Uh, and we definitely do not want to block users typing. The most important thing a uh, Rust analyzer can do is accepting the new edits. So. Uh, blocking here isn't really an answer. 
However, we can change this idea a little bit and actually make it viable. Instead of just waiting uh, until the all background work is completed, we can signal cancellation. We can notify both those threads. I guess I wanted this to be T2 actually. We can notify both those threads that there is a pending change and ask those threads to not complete the work normally, but instead to complete it as fast as possible. Uh, ask them to cancel. And that's exactly what uh, exactly the approach we're using in Rust Analyzer. So let's uh, back this immutable API up. Okay. So uh, if we go into the apply change method, we will see that uh, the first thing it does is that it requests cancellation. Uh, when you request cancellation, these two threads uh, get notified and inside the highlight method and inside the lay hint method, they will notice pretty soon that the actual work was canceled and they will try to wrap up the work as soon as possible. And uh, specifically what they do is that, we'll, that is that they will actually initiate unwinding and skip uh, every computation uh, such that the result of this uh, highlight or in the hint query would actually be an error cancelled. Uh, as you see, every method on the analysis returned this cancelable thing. And cancelable thing is just an alias for result where an error is cancelled. So if these things are actually still running by the time we get to this change, the result of those things would be cancelled. So we could write something like this. Assert T1 join uh, unwrap because we know that this thing won't panic. But we know that the result would actually be uh, cancelled. Yeah, anyway. Uh, we won't be covering in this lecture specifically how the cancellation works, but the overall idea uh, is as I've described. We have uh, like a main loop somewhere in Rust Analyzer. Which works with a specific instance of analysis host. On every turn of the loop, we uh, get new change. Then the, we apply this change to the host. And then we spawn some background work. Authentics highlighting for diagnostics, etc., etc. On the next iteration of the loop, when we apply the change, the previous background work will be cancelled. The change will be applied as fast as possible, and then we will spawn the next background work. If uh, the state of the code is crescent, uh, when there are no new changes, then all the background works completes, and the editor gets the results of syntax highlighting. To dive just a little bit deeper into the apply change, we can see that first uh, it requests cancellation, and then the first method, uh, which actually calls set on the database, which actually tries to mutate the data, would block until the uh, until all the other work is actually cancelled and can no longer access the database. The way uh, we uh, track this is that basically analysis and analysis hosts all share a single reference counted state and analysis hosts just wait until the reference count gets zero. So not only the actual queries like highlighting must complete for the host to be unblocked, but the whole analysis struct needs to be dropped. 
Okay. I guess that covers the flow of data in the system. Let me reiterate this again. So, Rust analyzer starts with an empty host. Then it, in a loop, applies some changes to the host, takes a snapshot using analysis method, and then spawns several background uh, tasks to do various kinds of analysis on those snapshots. If it so happens that a new change arrives at the same time while we have some pending background tasks are running, the main thread notifies those background threads that their work is no longer needed. At the first convenient moment, those background threads will notice this cancellation and cancel those works. As soon as all the background work is cancelled and all the analysis instances are dropped, the main thread uh, notices that it can safely proceed with, with mutating data and it will mutate data. Then it will spawn new background work, wait for the new change, etc. etc. Okay, um, this uh, I guess covers the overall data flow. Uh, one important thing which I haven't covered in this lecture and which I will cover in the next lecture is how do we actually tie together this abstract API with uh, apply change and analysis and the actual messages from the LSP protocol. Basically, where the main loop is and uh, how uh, is it working. But today I want to cover uh, in some more detail one more thing about uh, this ID API. Specifically, I've already mentioned that it kind of like erases semantics and tries to be uh, based on the plain old data structures. So let's cover this a little bit uh, more uh, in a little bit more detailed way. Let's look at the highlighting method. So naively, naively you would expect that highlight would return some very specific information about the source code. For example, uh, that uh, highlighting would return information which allows you to understand that this um, identifier HL range actually refers to this structure somewhere else. So something like um, hash map from ident to definition or something like that. And why would syntax highlighting do that? Well, because when you do highlighting, you actually care uh, what the stuff resolves to. Because for example, you see that uh, we want to highlight modules differently from functions. So we need to understand that like this identifier refers to this module, while this identifier refers to this function inside this module. I think we also highlight like things like trace differently. Yeah, uh, as you see, like uh, this thing is in italics and uh, this thing is not italics. So you need to understand where this identifier refers to the trait or not to do this. But surprisingly, this isn't what happens. If you uh, look at the actual structure of this data, it is very, very low level. It doesn't talk about anything like symbols or definitions or anything like that. Instead, it uh, uses the language of text documents, of ranges in these text documents, and of like specific flags, basically. Uh, the highlighting here returns just a plain vector which says uh, which text range in these documents should get which color. The text range is just a pair of two numbers. Text size is U32, text range is a pair of U32s. And the highlight is just a couple of uh, fieldless enums and tags. It's uh, nothing any, uh, it's nothing like detailed. So uh, why do we need here? Uh, why do we need this? It does seem like it would actually be uh, nice to expose more information here to give some rich model where you can um, get the entities and the relationship between the entities. 
However, uh, as Rust Analyzer evolves uh, pretty quickly, we want to be able to change our internal implementation without refactoring everything. And that's why in Rust Analyzer, we have certain crates which play the roles of facades. They try to separate one part of Rust Analyzer from another part, such that if you refactor the first part, the API of the second part, uh, like the implementation of the second part remains the same. And you need to change only the boundary of these two. And uh, this boundary role is exactly what Rust Analyzer is playing, uh, what uh, this IDE crate is playing. So for example, uh, if we change, how do we store references from identifiers to the actual things they refer to? We don't have to change this API at all because it simply doesn't expose this information. It exposes only uh, plain data which can be rendered to JSON. Uh, and that, I guess, is it. So, to recap, the ID crate is a good place to look at to understand what Rust Analyzer is capable of doing. Uh, this is the main interface between the actual language server protocol binary, uh, which uh, talks to the editor via standard input output, and the internals of the Rust Analyzer compiler, uh, which is this very sophisticated uh, incremental computation thingy. The interface doesn't directly expose this incrementality aspect and doesn't uh, directly expose the underlying semantic model of the language. It uses uh, rather simple data types instead. What it does expose, though, is the overall idea that we analyze some state which evolves over time. That's why we have this analysis host method and apply change method and uh, the main loop which sequentially applies changes to analysis host and then gets analysis and then uses analysis to compute highlighting and stuff. Finally, uh, we really want to enforce uh, that constraint that an analysis, a reading operation, can never block a writing operation, actually typing in a file. That's why all the analysis operations have this cooperative cancellation aspect to them such that when we apply a new change to the data, all currently running analysis operations are cancelled and the change is fully applied on the main loop. And I guess that's everything I wanted to cover about analysis and analysis host. Next time, we will actually look how this is plugged into the LSP server. We will look at the thing which is called the main loop. But for now, this is it. Thank you for listening. I still cannot stop OBS properly.